Today on Blue 58, the Packers' tight ends aren't all that exciting. Some might even say they're a little bit boring. But boring might still be good enough to get the job done in Matt LaFleur's offense. Plus, among the tight ends, there are still enough prospects for development that this position group could still be a net positive in 2022. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. want to give you another reminder that our podcast pitch scholarship deal is coming to an end uh, this week. Get your pitches in by 11.59 p.m. Friday evening uh, to be included in uh, in the contest for what's going on here. Top five will advance to the audience vote round, and I, I hope we, we have some really good submissions uh, this week. I'm really looking forward to seeing what people come up with. Uh, I will talk about that more in just a second, but for right now, let's dive right into tight ends. I've been looking forward to this particular positional preview for a while now. Because I think tight ends are awesome. And I've probably belabored this point uh, to a great extent over the years. But I have a special place in my heart for tight ends. Most of my time playing football was was as a tight end. I just think it's a neat position. You've got to be able to catch like a receiver, block like a reasonable approximation of a lineman, uh, be a specific, relatively specific size, uh, be a pretty good athlete. It it's, it combines a lot of interesting skills, and you have to have a, a certain amount of football intelligence to be a really good one, too, because you have to understand positioning and blocking schemes and routes and, and all of that. And it all works together to make you a really, I think, complete football player. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of tight ends go on to be tight end coaches and then go on to be NFL head coaches down the, down the road. I, I did a study a while back and found that, like, I think this was 2016, about a quarter of the league's head coaches had been tight ends or tight end coaches at one time. It Maybe not a one-to-one correlation, but it is, it is a good position for giving you a, a good, solid, overall understanding of how the game is supposed to work and how positions are supposed to work together. And I think you can determine a lot of of the health of an offense by looking at how a team utilizes their tight ends. And I'm not saying that every tight end has to have, or every position, every team has to have a a great tight end to be an effective offense. But if you use your tight ends well, chances are the rest of your offense is pretty well organized too, because it's a unique position. And you can still get a lot out of the position, even if you don't have a super duper ultra elite prospect at tight end. Unfortunately, tight end in Green Bay has been a little bit boring of late. And when it hasn't been boring, it's been frustrating. It's not that the Packers have neglected tight end. They have certainly tried. Let's rewind back to 2017 and look at some of the tight ends they've acquired in the meantime. Martellus Bennett, Jimmy Graham, Mercedes Lewis, Jay Sternberger, Josiah DeGuara. That's a lot of free agent money and a pretty good chunk of draft capital to try to get something at tight end. But in that same span, the best tight end they've had is one that they really weren't trying all that hard to get. Robert Tunyon was a late-season free agent pickup, originally signed as an undrafted free agent uh, by the Detroit Lions, who decided they didn't have any use for him, and so they cut him loose. And along comes Ted Thompson in one of his last moves as the Packers' general manager, He signs Tunyon, and he's been a pretty decent prospect since then. This season's tight end group, I think, is pretty close to the very definition of just being there. With Robert Tunyon recovering from his ACL injury, nobody's going to be a star this year. But among the guys that you would expect to make the roster, nobody should be outright terrible either. There's no one guy you look at and say, "What's, what's this bum doing on an NFL roster? The position group is just kind of there. But do you need a star tight end anyway? In Matt LaFleur's offensive system, I would say no. What do you need, though? You need a big blocker. You need someone versatile enough to do H-back type things. And you need someone who's a good enough athlete to take advantage of schemed open looks that we know Matt LaFleur loves to run. And although they may not have one guy who checks all of those boxes, by hook or by crook, all of those boxes are basically checked. If you're looking for a big blocker, you've got Mercedes Lewis and to a lesser extent, Tyler Davis. If you're looking for somebody who's versatile, you've got Josiah DeGuara and 
Dominic Daphne. If you're looking who, for somebody who's a pretty good athlete, you've got Robert Tunyon when healthy, you've got Josiah DeGuara, you've got Dominic Daphne, and you've got even Tyler Davis. You could work with that. It's not exciting. It's not a position group that is really going to do a lot for the tight end enthusiasts out there. But I think it's good enough to get the job done. Because in LaFleur's offense, the job really isn't all that big. So until the Packers get somebody who is that sort of star tight end, there's no sense really trying to to create that kind of role in your offense anyway. It's not like the Packers are going to be missing something in their offense because they don't have somebody who can fill their all-important tight end role. LaFleur's offense really doesn't have that kind of role. If you roll it back to, say, 2013, 2014, Mike McCarthy's offense was hurt, I think, by a lack of of solid tight end play. Richard Rodgers, you know, had his strengths. He never really dropped anything that came his way, but he didn't really give you any sort of dynamic playmaking. And dynamic playmaking from individual receivers was what McCarthy's offense really needed, and lacking one at the tight end position really hurt that offense overall. But in an offense like Matt LaFleur's, where you're, you're trying to create things from scheme, well... You really don't need the super elite prospect that the Packers really were hurting when they didn't have under under Mike McCarthy. This group is good enough to do what Matt LaFleur needs done in his offense. It's not going to be the most exciting group. The position or the the predictions for each of these individual guys is, is going to be fairly muted. I'll give you a bit of a spoiler here. But overall, they should be able to get the job done with what they've got. Before we talk about those guys individually, I do want to circle back to talking about the podcast scholarship pitch process here. This matters a lot to me, and that's why we chose to do this this year, because creativity matters to me. You know, I I like covering the Packers, but, you know, just if it wasn't the Packers, if it wasn't a podcast about the Packers, I would be doing some other creative project. Because that's that's how I'm wired. I want to be to making things, writing things, doing things with those gifts and abilities that I think that I have. And I know there's a lot of other people out there that also have that kind of drive. So I want to do what I can to put people in a position to do those sort of creative things. Because as successful as this show has been and the amount of work that I've put in it, you know, to get it to that point, I realize that a lot of the success of this show and creative endeavors that I've done in general has to do a lot with, you know, advantages that I have had built into my life. You know, I started Blue 58 at a time when when the podcast market was less crowded than it is now. I started it at a time when I had a lot of lot more time to work on it even than I, I necessarily do now. Or I guess maybe a lot more unstructured time. I really have to plan out time to work on the show now, having two kids and, and things like that. Um, even going back further, if you start back with my first Packers project, the Packer Perspective back in 2012. Shoot, as a single guy in 2012 with just a job and no other hobbies, it was all that I had to do. But I realize that not everybody has those advantages. So what I want to do with something like this is remove as many barriers to doing a creative project as possible. So just a reminder, this scholarship gets you a year of podcast hosting on Acast. For my money, the best podcast hosting platform out there. And it gets you a microphone, an AT2020 USB microphone, as well as a pop filter and an arm to, uh, to hold it up. That should get you started. Give me your pitches. We'll evaluate them. We'll have people vote. The best one is going to get all that stuff. And I hope that it helps somebody get involved with a creative project that they wouldn't otherwise have taken the plunge on. So that's my last best pitch for this. Pitches are due 11.59 p.m. July 15th. All right, Packers tight ends. We've talked about the group overall. Overall, I think the ceiling for this group is basically moderate expectations. There are two guys for whom I don't really have any expectations this year. That would be Elise Mack and Elliot Wolf. Maybe one of those guys, guys jumps up and knocks off Dominic Daphne or somebody else similarly far down on the depth chart. I don't know. I wouldn't count on it. Both of them seem like they have, you know, interesting abilities in and of themselves. I'm just not really banking on anything from either of those two guys. So those guys aside, let's start with, with Dominic Daphne. 
Daphne is basically the, the very poor man's version of Josiah DeGuara. He arrives with the Packers as an undrafted free agent in 2020 and fills that very similar sort of role to, Dom, or to um, Josiah DeGuara, starting shortly after DeGuara was lost for the 2020 season with a torn ACL. In two seasons in Green Bay, Daphne has appeared in 15 games and has a grand total of four catches and one touchdown. He can do a lot of interesting things. He can, you know, be that fullback. He can split out as a receiver. We've seen him do that. He can line up as an H-back. He can line up as an inside, inline tight end, though typically on the weak side of the formation. But looking at the depth chart ahead of him, I don't think your expectations for him can be anything but pretty low. He hasn't shown just tons and tons in his NFL career so far. And unless some things really break his way, I don't think there's going to be a super huge role available for him in 2022 as well. So expectations are pretty low. But he can meet those expectations, I think, by ending up on the roster again and then just hoping things break his way because injuries will happen and sooner or later somebody is going to, I don't know, uh, just be down for a couple games. You need Dominique Daphne to step in and do a couple things. He also has some special teams utility, and he can fill a lot of little roles on offense. Call him again, Josiah DeGuara Light. But he is going to need help from elsewhere on the roster. Somebody's going to have to open up a role for him, either by getting hurt or getting cut, for Dominique Daphne to really have a chance in 2022. My prediction for him for this year is that he will end up on the roster at some point. Maybe not initially, but I do think he is going to get to the 53 at some point this year. Moving on to Tyler Davis. Um, perhaps my most interesting tight end on the roster right now. He arrived in Green Bay last year, at least in small part because of Tim Tebow in Jacksonville. So remember there was a lot of furor over the Tim Tebow experience in Jacksonville last season. And one of the talking points that people flogged again and again and again is that he was taking snaps away from guys that had a real shot to be NFL players. You know, I'm not sure I entirely buy that. I mean, how many people was he really taking snaps away from as the third or fourth or fifth or whatever tight end on the roster in Jacksonville? I mean, who really knows? But one of those players might have been Tyler Davis because Davis was in camp with the Jaguars last year and ends up on his way out, arrives in Green Bay, hangs around on the practice squad, eventually heads onto the 53-man roster for a fairly small role in 2021. My expectations as a result are pretty moderate for Davis. I think he's a more interesting prospect than Daphne. I would love it if he grew to be a big contributor, but I think that's asking a bit too much from him. Because what he really needs to do in 2022 is essentially be Mercedes Lewis light. The Packers essentially have no other in-line tight end on the roster right now. They have nobody who's going to line up next to a tackle with his hand on the ground and be that traditional tight end uh, on the strong side of the formation. Tyler Davis did that at times last year, and he was the only tight end who really graded out comparably to Mercedes Lewis as a blocker, according to Pro Football Focus. That's his path to the roster, be a Mercedes Lewis type player, and then catch the ball when it comes your way. And I think it is going to come this way, come his way this year, because I think he's going to make the roster, and I predict that he will have double-digit catches this year. And that could be as few as 10, it could be as many as I guess technically 99. I don't think it's going to be 99. It could be closer to, it's, it'll be closer to 10 than 99, considerably. But I do think he's going to have double-digit catches this year. I also think he's going to start a game for the Packers this year. He will be a starter for the Packers at some point this season. I don't think he's going to be like a regular fixture in the starting lineup, but I do think he will end up starting a game for the Packers this year. And if he grows into a bigger role beyond that, big win. Now, Robert Tunyon is next up on my list. We kind of do this in ascending order of expectations. So he would have the third highest expectations among Packers tight ends this year because I don't really know what to, what to do with him because we haven't seen really super firm reporting on where he's at in, in terms of his ACL recovery. And everybody's going to only say good things at this point of the year anyway. But he is yet another guy coming back from an ACL injury. And even prior to the ACL, 2021 was a bit of a regression year for him, even pre-injury. And how could it not have been? 11 touchdowns in 2020, 
spectacular, obviously. But keeping up that rate of production would have been virtually impossible. The Packers also had to use him slightly more as a blocker last year at the start of the season due to issues at tackle. David Bakhtiari slow in coming back. Yash Nyman out there as a starter. You need Robert Tunyon in there to block. I think he was starting to turn the corner a little bit in that Cardinals game, and then he tears his ACL, and that's it for the year. Them's the breaks. It stinks, but now we're left with the aftermath of that. If he was healthy, I would say he would have high expectations this season, no doubt. But as we don't know what he's really doing as far as recovery stuff, expectations, I think, have to be pretty moderate. If he was healthy, again, he would have high expectations, but we should remember that if he was healthy, he might not even be in Green Bay. He hits free agency with two healthy knees. He's probably making close to double-digit millions per year. He's going to take a little while to come along this year, but his season also is not going to be defined by what happens early. He needs to make it back and slot into a role for the stretch run. So that's what he's got to do to meet expectations this year. Contribute in November, maybe on the early end, but for sure December and January and hopefully February. I predict he's going to start the season on the pup list. I think the Packers are going to be conservative with the guys coming back from ACL injuries this year. Also, given the timing, uh, being back for training camp would be pretty quick. Uh, So I think he's going to need that extra time. It would be about a, a year only. Um, if he went on the pup list for six weeks and then had the, the two or three week window, whatever that is, uh, to practice afterwards and then get added to the, the 53, it would be almost exactly a year from injury to back on the active roster. Um, if that was the the course they went with. And I think they're going to try to give him every bit of time that they can to get him up to speed and, and make sure he's healthy because if he starts practicing and, and it's you've got setbacks and stuff that complicates the whole process. So I think just start him on the pup list, get him back to as close to, give him as much time to just fully recover as possible, and then get him on the field, bring him along slowly so he's really contributing in November, December, and the playoffs. So pup list to start, I think as a result, he will have under the 35 catches, though he was on pace to, to get pretty close to that just through the, the eight games he was in last year. Um, he shouldn't have a problem meeting that if he was if he was fully healthy. That would there would be no problem there. But I think it'll be under thirty five catches for Tanyan this year. Mercedes Lewis. What do you even say about him? Um and that, that sounds like a negative. It's a positive. Because Mercedes Lewis has been essentially the exact same player since he arrived at Green Bay uh going on five years ago now. Uh it's just time marches on and so does Mercedes Lewis. Last year Maybe some slippage due to age. I know Bob McGinn um, of the Go Long project with Tyler Dunn, uh, whatever the, the official name of that outlet is, um, did not ha- was not super high on Lewis in 2021. I don't really know why. I think that's a question of expectations, again, uh, because I thought he was pretty good in 2021, but he was good in a very limited role. And that's always been the Mercedes Lewis experience in Green Bay because he's not going to be anything other than really just a a fence post blocker on the end. He's going to be a fixed position for you to rotate your offense around. And then he will catch the ball if he was wide open. And that's exactly what he did in 2021. He also may have had the single most disappointing play of the season, fumbling against the San Francisco 49ers in the playoffs. I, you can't talk about his 2021 without mentioning that, which stinks because I like him a lot as a player, but that may have been the deciding play in that game among a, a bevy of individual moments that turned against the Packers there. In terms of expectations for 2022, moderate seems exactly right for him. It can't be low because he's too good at what he does to really have low expectations, but it can't also really be high either because his skill set is too limited. Maybe not even skill set, maybe his use case is too limited. Because his skill set is phenomenal for what he does, but it's a pretty small list of things that he does for the Packers. Blocks well, catches when he's wide open. That's about it. You're not really doing schemed open looks with Mercedes Lewis, though the Packers do end up with a lot of looks where Mercedes Lewis, surprise, surprise, is running uncovered somewhere on the football field. Not typically very far down the football field, but um, 
he does tend to get open. So meet those expectations then by just continuing to be Mercedes Lewis. If he is as good in 2022 as he was in 2021, that is just fine with me. I predict that Lewis is going to appear in all 17 games, and then he will have more than 15, but fewer than 23 catches in 2021. Those are my two low, or that's the floor and ceiling, because 15 is the, the fewest catches he's had in a, in a year where he was really involved in the offense, discounting that first year with, with the Packers, and then he had 23 last year. That was his most. Finally, Josiah DeGuara. It's kind of been an odd career so far for Josiah DeGuara. I think even with the criticisms that I have of the 2020 draft class, it's not unfair at all to say that he was probably overdrafted. Even if you like Josiah DeGuara, and I, I do, it seems at the time even like a bit of a reach. But to be fair, in 2020, he looked like a great fit for what the Packers wanted to do very early. Even in the just 24 snaps that he played in that Minnesota Vikings game to open the 2020 season, you saw him line up as a fullback. You saw him split out into the slot. You saw, saw him start out in the slot and motion into the backfield. You saw him get involved in the checkdown game. He gets dinged up in his first game and he's out the next two. Okay, well, we'll get him slotted back in later on in the season. Well, he comes back and then he tears his ACL late in that first game back, not even on offense, but out there blocking on a punt. And that's it for him in 2020. 2021, I think a bit of a mixed bag. Some nice plays. His first touchdown catch was awesome. Great adjustment in the end zone. He also had a nice 62-yard catch and run against the, the Lions for a touchdown. That was great. There were also more than a few times where he was very visibly not on the same page as Aaron Rodgers, and Rodgers let him have it out there on the field, which is a pretty bad place to be, honestly. If you're in the doghouse with Aaron Rodgers, it is fairly difficult to get out. That he dug out at all at any point in the season is a credit to Josiah DeGuara. Statistically, also pretty disappointing. You take that 62-yard catch and run out of his numbers, he averaged 7.6 yards per catch in 2021. That's not getting it done. That is like Richard Rodgers' level yards per catch type stuff. So as a result, I think the expectations peak at, at pretty moderate for Josiah DeGuara this year. Of the tight ends coming into the season, I think you have to kind of have the highest expectations for DeGuara because he's the most pedigreed draft pick, the, the best athlete who is coming in healthy, the guy who has the most defined role, I think, coming into the 2022 season, who's going to be a, a, like a big part of the offense. But all that said, it's still not clear exactly what he is. I mean, we know what he is as a player. He's Matt LaFleur's Kyle Juszczyk, the Matt LaFleur's F-back in this offense. But it's not clear yet if he's closer to Kyle Juszczyk or Dominique Daphne. Both kind of do the same sort of things. Juszczyk, a huge asset for the 49ers. Dominique Daphne, more or less just a guy for the Packers. So how does DeGuara even begin to meet expectations this year? I think it's as simple as looking like he should have been a top 100 pick. Be a plus player, not just a novelty in the Packers' offense. Kind of a squishy goal. Kind of a tough thing to measure, but attainable, I think. Just do something that makes it look like the Packers were wise to invest such a high draft pick in you. This, prediction-wise, this shouldn't reflect on what he can do as a player because I think he does a lot of things that are not measured in traditional box scores. But I think if you're looking at the box score, he's probably going to have a fairly disappointing 2022 again. I think he's going to be under three receiving touchdowns again. He had two last year. And I think he's going to be under 400 receiving yards again. He's in the 200-something range last year. I still think it can be a good season for him, even if he doesn't meet... Uh, a lot of statistical, or doesn't put up, up a lot of big numbers statistically. But I think um, if if you end up disappointed in his 2022 season because he doesn't put up big numbers either, you're not necessarily wrong. Um, if that's what you're looking for out of tight ends, I mean, that, that may be a little bit of a problem looking at Matt LaFleur's offense, but I think saying you were the 94, 94th overall pick, we need more out of you than just being kind of this beefy gadget player. That's fair. And if you if you get frustrated with him and the Packers for, for not being more than that, I think that's, that's fair. 
it's it's maybe not a fair expectation for him looking at Lafleur's offense to to want him to be more than that. But it's fair to to be a little bit frustrated that he's not as well too. It may seem maybe a little bit of a contradiction, but I, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Overall, tight ends not necessarily exciting, but some interesting prospects there too. Tyler Davis comes along a little bit this year. Robert Tunyon comes back late in the season. Dominique Daphne takes a step forward. You might have something a little bit more than a group that's just there. Heading into 2022, just there seems like a pretty good description of what the Packers have at tight end. It's sort of, just sort of there. But they may take some steps yet too. So I've got for you in this episode. I appreciate you listening in. I'd appreciate it even more if you would share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it as well. It's going to help more people find the show, which is the number one way that we grow. It's also going to get more people involved in the conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.